or to be in a group or in a culture where you're doing break dancing, as they called it back then, because now we know it's not called break dancing. That's mm. the you know commercial media mm. title mm. for it. It's rocking, you know. Mm. So now to go to these clubs to dance as a young 11, 12 year old and be told that you've been turned away and I have to go back home. There was mm. times when my brother had to walk me back home to make sure I got home safe. You know, some yeah, of these yeah. young B girls, I love to deliver this message to them and let them know it didn't come so easy. It no. came with some element of segregation, racism, mm. sexism. You name it, it was there for me. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official dot com. Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Killer Podcast. All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller, live and direct, central London or as central as you need to be for the podcast. The only podcast that counts. Trust me, you don't want to hear, see, or be anywhere else. Get yourselves ready for the upcoming Hoddle Wars. It's time to graph punks up and get up with some NFT gaming. Also, big shout out to Chief Rocker Gear from streets to stage. Chief Rocker is the streetwear of champions. For those of you who are the uh, veterans in this game, thank you so much for following us and being a part of the culture uh, that we're, uh, you know, we're. We're um, documenting on for 500 plus podcasts into 2024. Um, uh, if you want more of this content, then you hit the television app, free download, iPhone, Android, for all your street culture, sports, all the disciplines you can think of and more in a handy dandy app. You know what it is. Um, inside the house today, we're going across country to meet a lady that was one of the first B-girls the UK brought into the wing. Um, no mean feat, also a culture creator in her own right, in her own right, Heartbreaker Project and more. She goes by the name of Bigo Hanafa McQueen Hudson. How are we, my darling? Yes, I'm blessed, man. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. You got my name on point there. <laughs> so you, you've done you've done some homework. <laughs> hey, listen, I I am a, a a fan of the culture. You've got to get the names right. You've got to know who yeah. is moving and who's shaking. Absolutely. Ain't that the truth? Absolutely, absolutely. Because some people say McQueen, and I'm so the Hudson side of my family. You know, so I'm yeah. salute both sides. If that makes sense, you know. Richly deserved your position um, in the UK. Hip hop hall of fame, I would say, in my mind anyway. Just the, the 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 audacity of jumping on the floor at a young age during the eighties and killing it on the floor the way you did. Uh, whereabouts are you at the moment? I'm in Wolverhampton. Awesome. How's it in Wolverhampton? Wolverhampton's blessed, you know. Same old, nothing changed, you know. A lot of pioneers still here. Pioneers in the music and the dance culture, you know, from from as early as the seventies. There's a lot of veterans um, still here, so, you know. Let's there. talk about the veterans that are currently residing. Well, I mean, of course, we know Goldie. Goldie's the staple. <laughs> Who else we got? We've got Birdie uh, from Wolverhampton B-Boys. Got Birdie. I mean, I can name the Wolverhampton B-Boys. You know, like, we have Smiley. You know, we've got DJ. That's his initials for his name. You know, we've got Pruma. We've got Lazy B. You know, these are the first generation, you know, the first... Generations of b-boys from the early 1980s. Yeah, when I'm talking about the 70s now, I'm talking the um, actual veteran from the dance hall era. So it's not so much the hip hop; it's more the dance hall, if that makes sense. Yeah, that I makes can name them. Sense. You, you know, because uh, I, I got to give love and respect to them all. You know, there's Rooney D, there's Master J. You know, and then we come into the the new generation of b-boys that I formed the crew. Which was myself, Birdie, Goldie, Kiddo, you know, Lewinsky, Freestyle, and and Reno, you know. So um, wow. Talk to me about how incremental the dancehall scene was. That um, the inspiration that then migrated into breaking at the time. Yeah, well, we're going to the seventies now. Yeah, so let's let's think about the era back then. So you t- you're dealing with reggae music. You're dealing with ska. Rock steady, you know. That's the that's the kind of era of the music you're dealing with. So it's very much um 
uh, a Jamaican environment you deal with there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we deal with music that speaks and talks to us about our heritage, about mm -hmm. our um, upbringing, about the impression that's going on. So when we all used to meet and go to blues and, you know, have these house parties, we used to like reminisce about Jamaica. I mean, even though I was born in England, we was raised in our homes as Jamaicans. I mean, some of us went to Jamaica early, in the early 70s, early 80s, you know, so we, regardless, we groomed them, but I mean, I am Jamaican, you know, by um, nationality, you know. Got you. So, yeah. So, so we, regarding the dance here and now with the music, yeah, we, we, we danced and we, we performed as um, a healing process to help us through oppression. So you hear in the lyrics of a lot of the music from back in the 70s about fighting against convictions. Bonnie Whaler, mm -hmm. you know? I'm a stepping razor, you know, uh, Peter Tosh, even though it was written by Gibbs himself. But, you know, here you have the lyrics and the music that would tell you who you are, what you are. And from there, we dance to these music and the lyrics. So how we dance is how we deal with um, the lyrics side of the music, you know? So, you know, to speed you up a bit, we have like, um, in, you know, dance like the jockey. Talking about, you know, gimmicking jockeys and dancing, like you're, you're riding a horse and things like that, you know? So, wow. Uh, so back in the 70s and 80s, you know, we had a language with the dance to help us through our oppression. We had the smarty dance, you know, we had the dance called the smarty dance, you know, you have to be smart and all this. This is the 70s, eight, early 80s, you know. And not many people realise this because I didn't go straight into b-boying, you know. There, there was a growth mm. back in the 80s and, you know, late 70s. I was into African arts. People didn't know that. I was an African dancer. My wow. Dance. So you, you, it's been your, your whole life. The dance has been yeah, yeah, yeah. fundamental. Yeah, because, you know, back in, the, back in the 70s, I'm talking late 70s now, there wasn't really um, a place for us. We didn't have anywhere that we call our own. I mean, you have the African Caribbean Culture Centre, you know, places like that that we could go to. Yeah. But we didn't have a, 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 a dominant fixed culture. Dancehall was the culture, that, that's all we had. There was yeah. nothing definite for us, you know? So mm -hmm. the music, the dance, even the art. We had art back then. We had our own graffiti back then. We had the African medallions back in the 70s. Made out of coconut shells. Of course. People don't realise this. Mm. We, we used to paint our bikes and paint our cars, things like that. And if you if you look back into the Jamaican dancehall, you see a lot of the, um, the cars were painted with names on it and, you know... It's had people's um, crew names or the dance on them. And it's funny you bring it up because, um, you know, I had a podcast with Cornbread, um, the graffiti uh, artist from the, you know, late, you know, early 60s, no, early 70s, mid 70s, you know, before before hip hop was even a thing in New York. But he was expressing that even during the Vietnam war protests, you know, graffiti was the thing in Philadelphia. Uh, and the fault lines of graffiti, of hip hop as a creative art, it comes from really indirect origins, doesn't it? Mm, definitely, definitely. I mean, I could take you back to, like, uh, for example, the streets of Kingston. And when you look at Kingston, you see the graffiti on the wall, and there's always a message no more war, no more oppression, mm -hmm. you know, fight um, communism and fight. These were the messages that we used to see on the walls. Yeah. And, you know, and, and not even just on the walls. We used to have it on, like, um, like on the buses or on uh, even our clothing, you know. So the graffiti art for us was always there. Mm. It's just that it wasn't an aerosol can. It was actual paint. Yeah, you yeah. know, it wasn't a spray can. That's the and only the difference. message, the message of it is key. Mm. I think nothing shouted more louder than when hip-hop came through the doors at its time. I mean, the, the graffiti became a new sort of protest, as did the rebel in the dance. That protest suddenly took a whole new lease of life for underprivileged people from harder backgrounds. Um, people that didn't feel like they had a voice all of a sudden 
you know, there was more than just punk, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let me let me share with you as well that people don't seem to understand. Back in the early 80s, yeah, we were we were new to this system here in the UK. So we start going to schools, the UK schools. In our homes, we raised as Jamaicans. Mm. Yeah. The minute we step outside the door, we're living in we're living in another new world. Can you imagine? In mm. our homes, all we listened to was reggae music. That's it. As we step out of the house, we hear something different of a music playing. You know, just wow. think of the child's mind as a child. I'm seven, eight, nine years old then. Yeah. Can you imagine? It was alien for me, for us. Your mind must you have know? been blood. I mean, it's almost like, yeah, like you say, open the door and all of a sudden you've got this, you know, jet stream of new stuff yeah. coming at you. Because the house up opposite us would have Bangra. We never heard Bangra. What? We didn't know what it was. And then you have the Irish playing their music. Wow. So I, I don't know if you could see the picture I'm giving you mm. as a young child back then. That's bonkers. But, yeah, people don't realise. I, I, when I say to you know, when people talk to me and ask me a question, oh, what was it like back in the 70s or the 80s? And, and I'll give them the story. They, I like to go deep and let them know that it's not as, you know, as you see today, like hip hop right. here, hip hop there, because it, back then there was no hip hop. It wasn't even called hip hop back then for us. You know, to hear the passion in, in you expressing that, it's it must be hard to not. You can't escape that impact. That it, it's so, it feels so recent. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, let me let me point out to you. Our parents remember we're the first generation of they call it windrush. I'm not a windrush. Mm -hmm. I don't like the term calling me a windrush. You know, I'm an African Caribbean. Mm -hmm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just playing words and you know being a political uh, correct. But anyway, from that generation of the first Jamaican immigrants to come to the UK, yeah? Mm -hmm. Our parents didn't know any better but to think England was the motherland. I don't know if it's something that you understand what I'm gonna to get to now, yeah? Mm -hmm. but, um, so they was telling us we're English, just telling us that we're English. And we can understand why we're English in, if, in, in a house with Jamaican, we can understand that. Wow. And then we go out in the streets, and people call us West Indians. If it was West Indian, we couldn't understand how these things are telling us. You know, think about it as a seven-year-old. Think about when you were seven years old, eight years mm. old now, you start going to school. And people start, start telling you that you're West Indian. You go home, you say to your mom and dad, um, they're calling us West Indian. And our parents are like, what are you on about? You're not West Indian, you're English. Yeah. Man, that must be... So... <laughs> Honestly, <Yeah>. like... <laughs> to, to, to have... To have one set of idea of who you are, but then to be outside and, you know, be told what you are in one capacity and told what you're, that's one hell of an identification crisis. Absolutely. We was going through an identity crisis. And I'm going to get to this point, okay, because here is, um, a, just call me a nine-year-old, nine, ten-year-old, nine, because I'm yeah. coming to the hip-hop year in a bit, yeah? You know, as far as we're concerned, we eat, sleep, think, everything Jamaican. And then we wake up in the morning, we go to school, and the school's full of white kids, and we've been told, you know, we're West Indians. Mm -hmm. You think, fair enough, we're West Indians. Our parents tell us, no, you're not West Indians. No, you're not Jamaican, you're English. And then we have reggae music that's giving us another message mm -hmm. about oppression. And then we can relate to the oppression from Jamaica and come, you know, you Whoa, know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got you. So we was lost. In, well, I'm not saying we. I was lost in this kind of bubble, whereas we couldn't find a, a place. We, uh, you know, we couldn't find our place who we are, who, who, who we're gonna be. And then what happens? Hip hop, hip hop came and gave us an identity. Because by then now. You know, we had to come to this, you know, terms that, okay, we, we, we're we black, we're black Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. Not even black British then, because we're not even black British then. Black Caribbeans, mm -hmm. black West Indians, you know. Mm. And then 
And then we, we will play the music from Jamaica that would give us an identity of Jamaica. And then we were told we're not Jamaicans. And then hip hop, hip hop, hip hop music. Well, we didn't call it hip hop music. We called it New York music back then. So New we listened York to music. New York music. And New York music was played in a dance hall, but very on a low, you know, it wasn't even so much hip hop. It was more chic, you know. Okay, kind of got you. Yeah. And the only um, music that came with the funk that we could relate to only because of the title was Tom Brown, Jamaican funk. And that mm-hmm. gave us the um, that gave us our um, slight identity into the funk era, into listening to that kind of music. Mm-hmm. You understand? And then from there we start. You know, my brothers came home. You see, I come <laughs> from a household with just brothers, mm-hmm. all of my brothers. They, you know, just you know, and they used to go to all the all dayers and the clubs because wow. they was into sound system. And then they would come home and say, oh, you know. I don't know if how young you are, but we have TDK tapes and all this. Where Go you know you. they used to come home with TDK yeah, yeah, tapes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They say that they heard this music and it's from America. And my brother, you know, one day I remember, I remember it as plain as. <laughs> anyway, he put the music on, and for me and my brothers, we stood there looking at the um, the the cassette tape and thinking, what kind of music is this? And it was um. I think it was Rapper's Delight. The legendary, yeah. the iconic yeah. question. But, we, but hear this though, Killer, hear this now. We couldn't understand what they were saying in their rap music. Wow. So hip hop, yeah, hip hop. Yes, again, it's just another. I understand it. Yeah, it's another, uh, it's another red herring that, that adds into your tapestry of uh, identity. <laughs> or, or, or rather, pulling together some sort of identity. Like now, it's hip hop, New York music, but they're playing this in the clubs. But then the protest music and the, what we yeah. are as as a culture and a community. I mean, it was just it must have been an absolute head yeah. fuck, might I say? I mean, think of a mind of a nine year old. Yeah, ten year old. Wow. That's what I keep saying to people. We wasn't teenagers when we came into this. We wasn't even teenagers. Yeah. You know, and to hear all this music, our parents didn't like it. They used to say, switch off that music. What kind of madness are you playing? Switch it off. And because wow. we had the big speakers in the house, my brothers, they, they had big speakers that amp and, you know, blasting the music out of the house, you know. Our parents used to tell us, switch it off. Don't want to how, hear that how, how influential were your brothers? Because that, that, by the sounds of them, they had the right idea. The, the music was correct. The, the zeitgeist was there. <laughs> Very influential. I mean, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be into b-boying or b-girling or you know, rocking, yeah. you know, because they used to go to the clubs and they used to, um, like, come home and, like, say, oh, sister, was these guys doing these movements, spinning on their backs and spinning on their heads. And I was like, what madness is that? Remember, I'm into African dancing, mm-hmm. you know? I'm into African dance, all this talk, whatever, and, you know? So, for me, it's like, what kind of dance is that? I don't want to know. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't really. Yeah, I, I, I didn't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> but then um, they used to say, "Oh, there's some break dancing that's going to come on TV." You know? Yeah. Let's let's you know wake us up in the morning when you get up and you know. So we used to sit around the TV and wait for this program and wait, and then it came on. And I used to look and think, "What kind of dance is that? That that's not dancing. That's more acrobatical." You know? For me, I thought it was a camera trick. You see? I'm from that era, camera tricks. Because every time we watch kung fu movies, right. we, we was into kung fu movies. And, and that was the, the yeah, yeah, that's right. And they were doing trickery that wasn't always yeah. mastered the natural way, right? Yeah. All these backflips in the air, you spin and spin and spin and you don't come down. All these camera tricks. Mm. The horror movie, camera tricks. So I thought it was a camera trick. See somebody spinning on their back. Wow. Looking like a little ball, a circle, like they look like small spinning. I thought it was a camera trick. And for the, you're the first person to, in such, I mean, this is so, what you're talking about here, in fact, from the very get go of your podcast, is so descriptive. I don't think I've heard anyone explain the, the impact that social, cultural, environmental elements played into the mindset of the youth back at back in the day that yeah 
particularly obviously from a black community yeah. who lacked any sort of guidance in being British and then having this incredible <laughs> hip hop culture suddenly come into play and you had to kind of, again, you had to reprocess everything all over again. Absolutely. We had to. And, you know, you have to remember as well, our parents was there. They was involved with our grandparents, our great grandparents, because we was in a typical Jamaican household. Everybody lived in one roof, under yeah. one roof. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our yeah. grandparents couldn't stand this kind of culture. They said, stop behaving like this and stop what you're doing. You know? Wow. The dress code. We didn't wear we didn't wear tracksuits back then. We wear our khaki, our Jamaican khaki suit and you know, with khaki suit and thing. Thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Back then it was all about khaki suits. You understand? Yeah, so it was there an element of rebelling, Hanafa? Was it like the more you were told one thing, you would because to be fair, I would measure you on pretty headstrong as a lady. I can imagine as a teen, you were ready for war. Man, I was so rebellious, trust me. I got <laughs> it from my mother, you know, because she was a Pan-African and she was an activist, my mother. And my grandmother was like, um, she she was an activist as well, my grandmother. She had this garby kind of um, uh, mindset, mm. you know, don't burn your hair and don't do this and buy black. And, you know, back then she used to say, oh, go down to the Jamaican shop, make sure you go to him and buy the food that we need you know what I mean mm. my grandma had that mindset so like um I was rebellious in terms of when I went out on the streets you know what I mean anything for me was all for my people you know especially because we experienced the racism the attacks and we mm. had the, you know we had phone calls people phoning our house because my mom was an activist she was so active people used to phone our house and wow. give us a nigga talk down the phones and all this and really you know, so she was an yeah. activist as well yeah, yeah, yeah. She used to be a uh, part of the Pan African movement. Uh, Fantastic. The- and, um, um, she done rallies in Wolverhampton. We used to, I mean, I was one of the first students of the Stephen Biko school. This is a Pan African school. Yeah, we went to the Stephen Biko school. She sent us there. Wow. And the school people going, um, I think it's a, the school must be about 48 years old now. Uh, it's still in Wolverhampton, still going, still active. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, school. Wow. You were. You were born into the power of total and utter defiance and, you know, just strength. That's fucking great. We were warriors, man. I mean, like, back then, you know, it's either, you know, there's a, there's a saying, it's either freedom or death. For me, it was freedom. You're mm. fighting for your freedom, you know what I mean? Mm. Because we were, um, you know, we had experienced this, you know, discrimination, segregation. Mm. You know, we, we experienced that. It wasn't as, as bad as it was in the, um, in America with the African Americans, but here we had experienced that. Yeah. Definitely. So when you when you get when you get certain characters in the hip hop scene suggest such movement, and then when someone like Public Enemy, for instance, comes into play, uh, well, you speak you're speaking to the minority without question. Even if you've got an inkling of understanding what's going on in America, it's relatable. Hmm. You know, when, you know, you said a key thing there, because when PE came out, you know, I just loved it because they spoke my language. I I, I liked the the, um, the vibes that they were bringing. Yeah. But what did it most for me, in all honesty, was people like Just Ice that brought yes. the reggae and Jamaican vibes together. Absolutely. You understand? Yeah. yeah, because we still live, eat, sleep Jamaican in the house. Can I be controversial as well? I think Just Ice sure. did it way better than KRS One. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. There's just something about KRS One adding any reggae. What I do whenever I get excited? That was just Jamaican vibe. That was, mm. you know. Dang. And then, and the thing is, because because you know we love that you know, that KRS one and you know I me, mean, what they were bringing, that Jamaican. We loved it here mm. in the UK. Yeah. Change the but, game. Change the game. Yeah, yeah, for us. Because we wanted to feel and hear some Jamaica at least. You know, and we were so ignorant. We didn't know Americans can be Jamaican. We you know Yeah. And and also, you know, Demon Boys and London Posse, they they were there before to my understanding, they were doing it way ahead of America bringing Yeah. Well, there you go. You said the key thing there. London passing. 
You know, mm. Rodney P. You can't you can't go wrong with them people. That, let me tell you something. When it comes to them guys bringing the Jamaican vibe, they just that's right. I, I don't even know the the key word, but they were phenomenal. Yeah, you know, they they're set champions, standard. total champions, and warriors and champions. I, I have to give them all that credit because I'm telling you now. Today, um, I think I saw one of your videos or posts of the uh, one of London Party, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And straight away, I thought, wow, just think, these guys did it back then in the 80s. You know? The 80s back. was, I'm just going back to what you were explaining about what the 80s, the, the temperature was on the ground, the climate was in yeah. society. <laughs> that is radicalism right there. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, People don't realize that um, coming to the dance now, uh, the b-boy, we put that radical stance in our dance as well. People didn't mm. see this. You had the opera, which was like the fighting. Yeah, mm. you had the windmills, like certain windmills. We had gestures, like certain things we do with our arms, and you know how we would in our windmills, and we did certain things that mm. people didn't realize that we were sending a message. They called you that. They called your move the Nutcracker, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I didn't have the nuts to hold, but <laughs> <laughs> that's an OG name, right? There. You do the math. You know what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, do, do you know? I'll tell you how that came. That knowledge, how that came to me. You know, so years later, because I retired at b boying from um, 1986, 87, I stopped breaking. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I was about 16 years old, 17 years old. So years later, um, obviously. The internet came, you had YouTube, and people saying, you know, got your own video, people's playing your video, doing your windmills, calling mm. them nutcrackers. I said, what are you on about? <laughs> I said, go on YouTube, you see some video of you do on you. See, think of the era. When yeah. I left the era, there was no computers, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram, none of this. And all of a sudden, people's telling me they're playing footage of me doing nutcrackers. I said, what are you calling nutcrackers? Never yeah. heard of them. YouTube, yeah. YouTube just completely threw me in a spin as well. I remember it being, I think, 2004, 2005. No, YouTube ain't that old, but I remember coming into one photo session I was doing. I can't remember what magazine it was, but they were like, have you seen you on YouTube? Was that me on, what's YouTube? What are you talking about? It's just a mind-blowing thing at the time. And we, we you know, yeah. I'm my age as, as much as as all of us at the moment, but I, but I genuinely remember that being a thing and, and looking at people's comments and stuff and thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, let me say now, um, my windmills, um, okay, for, for me, could, People say I'm the first. You know, it's not, by the way, it's not me saying I'm the first UK people. People telling me I'm the first. That's the title they gave me. And I think they're looking at the level I was dancing at back then. Yeah. And I was the only one that appeared on TV doing it back then. The first to get the sponsors, because I was the only one to get sponsors, the first B girl to get all them sponsors. Puma, Yo, that's crazy. Nike, but way before Nike and all that. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Not even Nike came in. <laughs> no Adidas, you know, nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. Coming back to back then, you know, my brothers. I have to give them credit because we was living in a sexist environment. Mm. Seriously, UK is still very sexist. Yeah. And back then, some clubs I was not allowed to go in. I couldn't go into some of the centres and the clubs. Because mm. I was a girl. And I ain't even playing. I ain't going to sugarcoat me not. Listen, I'm not even trying to make it look good or not, not bad or what. I'm telling you straight. Wow. I was not allowed to go in some of them clubs to dance because I was a girl. Even the even at the, was, even if you were at the right age, still not having it? No, there, no. Because, well, all right. In all honesty, there was age restrictions. Nightclubs. Of course, I wouldn't go to nightclubs. But there were centres, certain centres where really? I could have gone, but I can't go there to dance. You wow. understand? And my brother stood up to some of these bouncers and people at the doors and said, "Listen, we want our sister to come in with us. She's, you know, she's mm. part of this. She's part of this. You know." Yeah. I was like Absolutely. eleven by then. I was about eleven years old when I start going out. And if you're going into like a centre, which is community led anyway, what's yeah. That doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Yeah. I just couldn't, I could go in, 
Some clubs would allow me in, but I couldn't dance. Some clubs would allow me in, but only to stay to the side. And uh, certain things, you wouldn't believe this. Mm. 80s. Mm. Man, look, there'll be young people watching this at the moment. And and I was born in the 80s. I was uh, 78. So I grew up in the 80s. It's hard to... It's hard to really um, understand the... Even for TV programmes, the condescending talk down at anything that they don't understand that didn't fit the status quo that didn't match yeah. what their opinion was. you know you could have like comedians that are presenting tv shows and you now you watch back on them and think just damn that's harsh or what the f- what's the matter with him like what, what why but, but that was the that was the the world literally the world back then wasn't it mm. Mm. i mean if you check it as well back then girls weren't allowed to play football we couldn't play cricket you understand? Mm-hmm. Certain sports we weren't allowed to do. Mm-hmm. So to be in a group or in a culture where you're doing break dancing, as they called it back then, because now we know it's not called break dancing. That's mm-hmm. the you know commercial media mm-hmm. title for it. It's rocking, you know. Mm-hmm. So now to go to these clubs to dance as a young 11, 12 year old and be told that you've been turned away and I have to go back home. Mm-hmm. There was times when my brother had to walk me back home to make sure I got home safe. You know, some yeah, of these yeah. young B girls, I love to deliver this message to them and let them know it didn't come so easy. It no. came with some element of segregation, racism, mm. sexism. You name it, it was there for me. Mm, mm, mm. But that's why I'm saying I got to give credit to my older brothers, to all my brothers, all of them. Yeah. All of them. Or even, even some of the guys that was around, like some of the neighboring, you know, members of the community who was there, they were very supportive with me as well. Trailblazing. Trailblazing. That's what this is. Trailblazing. To go in these clubs with your trainers on as well, we wasn't allowed to wear trainers because girls didn't wear trainers back then. We we weren't allowed. We couldn't wear the trainers in the clubs. Today, some clubs, you can't go to the clubs with shoes, with um, training shoes on, with trainers, Mm. as you know, today. Mm. Mm. Can you imagine the 80s? (laughs) <laughs> may I, listen, may I tell you straight or <laughs> ratted? May I tell you straight or it go? Uh, uh, I, I do not doubt it for a second. I mean, when I think about the red tape that goes into most of these clubs, and they but they want here's the here's the irony is particularly the fifty years of hip hop. They want a bit of hip hop. They want association. It's not like it's a hidden art. It's global. It's a billion dollar business. No matter what genre, what side of the of the aspects you you, you you know you flit on, they want a bit of it in the club. But they want it controlled. They want it their way, and they want it quickly and out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fucked yeah. up. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, let's let's look at where we are today. I mean, like you got a lot of B girls, for example, going to the clubs. Mm. People wear their trainers, they could wear, you know. And there's times where sometimes, like, I'm driving my car or parked outside some club, and I look at some of these girls walking in with their trainers on, and, you know, I think, mm. look at that, man. They're not going to be questions like how, how I was back then, yeah. you know. Yeah. How I was back then, it was like a, like a nobody. You could come mm. in, could, but she can't. Mm. This is the language they use on us as kids. Remember, I was a child. I was a child, 11, 12 years old. And back then, you know, obviously, you know, there was clubs where there were issues with, um, you know, black guys going down there. And, you you know, there was a lot of, you know, black guys can't go in this club because of how they looked. Well, and and it's got to be with a certain number of women. It can't be in groups. And because that, yeah, it it gives off the the wrong energy, the wrong impression. That's what promoters, or more so, you know, general managers used to. Fuckery. Yeah, it was just complete and utter fuckery. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling you as it is, you know, because, you know, for me, I couldn't understand what the problem was. Mm. My brothers couldn't understand what's the problem, man. You know, she's she with us. We look after it in the... In, remember, it's not a nightclub. It's just a club. It's just a centre. Mm. It's not a youth club, not nightclub, because I know I can't get in the nightclub, so I'm not going to go to the nightclub. It's a centre. And all we want to do is go somewhere where we could dance, rehearse, practice, just, you know, 
And for me, it was a no-go. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow me. So what did that do, Hannah, for, for your your creative superpowers, shall we say, your centralising of one's, um, you know, external creative being? Like, what? how did you respond? Because I can imagine, <laughs> this is like, the wrath must have come out. It must have just been total and utter red-blooded aggression. <laughs> That's why I came out with the nutcrackers. <laughs> because, TJ, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, you put it in the dance. You know, honestly, seriously, you put it back in the dance. Mm. The aggressiveness and all this, you put it back in the dance. The anger, it's like if you're a tennis player and you're told certain rules can't go ahead because you're black, you're going to be aggressive with it. You're going to serve that ball. And that's what I did. Your form I of protest. Your yeah. form of protest yeah. in action. <gasps> that's what it was. It's crazy. Love it. I like to say to some people that um, how I dance was like a form of, um, it's like a weapon for my, you know, it's, it's a way for me to tell people, F you, I mm. can do this better than you because I can't get in the clubs. Here's what I got. Yeah. See this. So and good. you know, uh, uh, let me let me let me kind of fast forward a tiny bit now. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. now, hip hop gave me an identity. So I'm no longer Jamaican, no longer Black British, no longer West Indian, no longer you know all mm-hmm. these kind of titles they gave us. Mm. I was now a b boy. Incredible. Mm. Not B-girl, not B-girl, you know, a B-boy. Uh, uh, why is that? Why, why is that? Why did that, why did it translate to the culture like that? Yeah, um, I think it's part ignorance because we didn't know how to find the culture. We didn't know how to look in. You have to remember, we didn't get workshops here. Mm. Back then, there were no workshops for us. Also, do you think from a from a UK standpoint, because you were one of the first female breakers, one of the first B-girls. So to write the history chapter like that, but not from the, the place of origin, do you think that played a part in it? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> okay. So all right, let me let me let me let me share with you now. How we learned about the culture and studied was through the TV. Mm-hmm. We didn't go to workshops. All the workshops, they were done in London. So we couldn't, remember, we were kids. We couldn't travel to London, but we were young. Mm-hmm. 12, by then, we was 12, 13 years old. Mm-hmm. I heard that there were Americans who were going to London and doing, you know, workshops in London. Or not. We didn't have that. Okay. So, so we had to anything. learn through the videos and TVs that we saw ourselves. We had, I, I used to read the magazines. Remember back in the days, we had the Looking magazine, Looking. Yeah, of course. I used to buy that regular just to yeah. see what's going on in hip-hop. And then we had these new magazines coming out, Hip-Hop Connections. Yep, that's right. Connections? Yeah, that's right. Of course, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But we, I used to buy these magazines regularly. I think they came out monthly or something like yeah. that. And then Smash Hits came along. You Just anywhere that had a Smash bit of hip-hop, yeah. wouldn't it? Just anywhere. Yeah, Blue Beat magazine. Yeah. So this is how I had to study and learn about the culture. And then by then, um, my mother got involved because she she used to be um, like the agent because she was concerned for us, especially mm-hmm. for me because of what was going on in the scene. You know, you hear you hear about the little you know problems of me getting in the clubs and you know it's late because my my brother was like sixteen by then. He was 16, 17 years mm-hmm. old. You know, by then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the elder ones they were like 18, 19, and they was doing their YTS training. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So m- there were times where they didn't want to go to dance anymore because they had to go to work in the morning for their training. So there was uh... me and Birdie, we were the youngest one. Me and Birdies were the youngest in the family. Yeah. So hear this now. So hear this now. My mother decided to to manage us, you know, so mm-hmm. that we wouldn't get in ripped off because we, we got ripped off. We were dancing for one pound. Uh, one pound each. We had to wow. perform for a pound each, one pound fifty, and then we was about twelve years old. So, wow! Like we used to get twelve pounds. Uh, Crazy mad times. Believe you me, that's what we got. And what we do with that money, we use that money to catch the bus back home. <laughs> 
liberties, well, I, absolute if liberties. I was, listen, man, if I ever tell you some stories of where we're coming from. Wow. And the sexism that I had to experience just to get it, you know, just to this seriously. Many times I keep thinking to myself, I must put on a session with B girls and let them know, enjoy the dance. Yeah. I didn't get to enjoy. There was times when I had to go into the male toilets just to get change because mm. I couldn't let it in that I was a young girl. That must have tainted your, well, not only your experience, but your, toilets. yeah. Yeah. I had to go into the boys' toilets to change into my tracksuits so that they wouldn't see that I was a girl getting change. Wow. In the toilets with my brothers, I had to go and get change. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> this is this such a... There's so much I could tell you, seriously. Mad. I remember going to this show and, you know, because I'm not a tall person, you know. You know, I'm not tall. I'm 5'2". You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But back then I was very puny. I was a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like we 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 went to um, I think it was London Hammersmith and uh, oh gosh, did we have a problem getting me in? We had to change my clothes and my brother said, no, put this tracksuit on, you look bigger there. No, put this tracksuit on, change my clothes, change this. My mum said, put this hat on it, put this, and then uh, fixed me up like I was like. Almost so your mum was in on it. Your mum was like in on it. Just she was in on it. <laughs> she was. In. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, just to make me look a bit bigger, make me look like a boy or man at least, or you know. <laughs> and I got in. This is Hammersmith. We have this, um, it, you know, because Hammersmith, I wasn't allowed in there because I think it was 18s only or something like that. But anyway, oh, by the time we got in, my mum said, go straight into that toilet, go with your brothers now in the toilet. So I had to they push me into the toilets with the men's toilets to get changed with my brothers. Incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And Hammersmith yeah. of all places, you know. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere I've been bunked. Listen, man, if I tell you some stories, you know. Listen, and that day, um, so what happened now? People used to come to me and say, does your dad own a club or does your mum own a club? I said, no. Nah. He's the one, how did I get in? Yeah. Wow. So I, I had to change my dress code. There was times I had to wear a mini skirt and some high heel shoes trying to get in a club. And um, it, it kind of worked. I had to pretend my, one of my brothers was my partner or my, my um, you know, boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. That is just too much. Um, crazy. Who, who who influenced you? I mean, you know, let's go back to that time. Cookie Crew, I guess, would, yeah. would be a really strong, powerful female duo of its time, right? I have to cookies, man. I have to big up the cookies then. Yeah, man. You know, I first met cookies in, um, it was Brixton Fridge. We didn't really talk because we, you know, because we, we have two different uh, kind of um, languages. There was the MCs, I was in the break dancing, you know. Mm-hmm. So we didn't really talk, but we just used to see each other. But because with the crew, the B-boys, they, the B-boys went and spoke to them first. And, you know, and that's how it came. You know what I mean? They was talking and I was too busy dancing. Every minute we want to dance. You know what I mean? I was there busy dancing all the time. So he invited us down to... Um, to London and um, so we went to London and we went to an event yeah, I think it was um, Young Gifted and Broke this is back mm-hmm. in the 1960s um, Ricky Reynolds event or something like that gotcha so, so anyway we went to this event and then from then our relationship just um, got stronger you know they they really um, they were great to be with and we used to invite them to Wolverhampton to spend time with us and there was a time when we was on BBC um, Saturday Superstore and we had to go to um, the TV um, studios like early in the morning, you know, to get ready, you know, to go down. So we had to be there for about like seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning before the show began. Because, you, you know, you have the, um, the yeah. rehearsals first and all that. Yeah, and yeah. Cookies invited us to stay at the house with them. And um, all these things we appreciate so much, you know what I mean? All the time we used to spend. In London with Cookie Crew. Yeah. So when we had shows live on live TV in London, we used to stay at Cookie Crew's house. That's yeah. incredible. See, and I think there is this inherent connection within hip hop and the other cities. Uh, I always go on about like the, the the connectivity of northern cities, well, from Midlands upwards, um, 
Birmingham, Coventry, Wolverhampton standard, you know, then into Derby and, you know, Leicester. And it's all very close. And and the, the, the relationship that London has with that as well, particularly along the coast, the southeast cities around there, you know, hip hop really bridges so many. Uh, it well, it overrides anything of, you know, what's the word? Um, I forget the word of it, but you know, I'm coming from it's it, it, it gets ri- it dispels any right. <clears throat> weirdness, animosities, that sort of thing. It, 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 it brings things together, doesn't it? It brings yeah. things together, yeah. You know, you know, let me let me. Bring something. Let me just bring something to your attention quickly about um, the cities and you know. Yeah, so, please do. Yeah, you know, back back in the eighties, so you had Nottingham was like um, Rock City Crew, who was called Supreme Team, and that was their actual name. Then you had Derby Shades, Sheffield Smack Nineteen, yeah. Wolverhampton B Boys, yeah, London. You had um, you know Live to Break, London All Star Breakers, you know Manchester Broken Glass. We were the main crews in the main cities that kept this scene and kept it going, you know? We used to do all these um, shows or we used to attend all day as and perform at most of these events, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, Electro Rock was the day. I don't know if you've seen Electro Rock. Well, um, yes, right, yes. Some people call it hip-hop at the Hippodrome, but it's called Electro Rock. So Electro Rock was the day where everybody came together mm-hmm. yeah, and performed. We we didn't know what that music video was going to be about, by the way. Yeah. But with all these cities bringing, you know, kind of like bridged the culture more. Yes. It brought us all together. Bringing their flavours in. Yeah, yeah. And then everybody began to identify um, certain B-boys, B-girls, artists, DJs, According to their city, we were Wolverhampton B Boys, London All Star Breakers, Nottingham Rock City. It gave the title of the city before the name of the crew. This is what happened. Mm. Yeah, Derby Shades. You know, that's, that's mm. this is how we were called. Manchester and then, and then what that did was it created that that almost like celebrity like status, like yeah, 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 yeah. champion certain characters within the crew for the moves that they were doing. Yeah, yeah. Identity yeah. within the cities. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because each each city and each crew had their own personal key person who was known for something. Like for example, you had um Cutmaster Swift, London. Mm. Mm. You know, you, you know, you had certain people, Sea Cold, rest in peace, beatboxing, you know, mm-hmm. London. Yeah. Here in Wolverhampton, it was just Wolverhampton B Boys and myself. Because people used to see me by then as a separate like a separate individual because they began to realize I was a girl. Mm. You look at my old clips, I'm always wearing tracksuit, looking like one of the boys, apart from the one when I'm wearing my skirt, the tennis skirt. That's right. Yes, yes. When you was you was extra young at that time. Yeah, I was about 15 by then. 15, yeah. 15. Um the the spectacle that that must have given you towards the commercial arena. I mean, talking about standing out, but the, the, the you know, even to this day, well, no, actually not to this day. There's certainly a novelty factor where female beatboxers are concerned still. But for breaking at that time, I guess it was, yeah, very much a similar light to, to female beatboxers. It's like such a, like a, like a tropical bird, you know, it's rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know why I wore that skirt? Because I was at school then. Um, I think I was having an exam at the time and I couldn't go to Puma. Um, Puma Warehouse, we we had access to Puma um, anytime we wanted to go. We had to make appointments and go down. You know, my mother used to help us out with that as well. So um, Birdie, um, my brother, he, he went to Puma um, because we had this TV show on Time Team TV mm-hmm. and it was to promote Electro Rock. So... Birdie went down to the Puma and I said, just get me a nice tracksuit that makes me stand out a bit. And he came up with this tennis skirt because the tennis skirt was um was to promote Wimbledon at the time. So you have um, Martina Narrativi Lova, 
um, mm. the Wilberton champion, she had the same tennis outfit as me. So we were the only two with this tennis outfit and it was to promote Wimbledon. So if you take back that clip, it was wow. the time when Wimbledon came out. So that's why I wore the skirt to promote uh, Wimbledon and to promote tennis outfits. Because it's, it's the last thing you'd expect a big girl to be wearing, that's for sure, for the time. Exactly, back then. And they <laughs> were shorts. Sure. Sure. They were my panties. Yeah. <laughs> and they were shorts. Back yeah, then, yeah, I figured. Tennis shorts <laughs> back then. I figured. Yeah. I figured. It, it's, it's just, you never see it. Do you know what I mean? You never see that get up on a on a on a on a breaking, um, you know, in yeah. a circle ever. <laughs> <laughs> For real. And you know, it's funny now because um, there was the times where um, I wanted to wear high heel skill, high heel shoes to like before mm. uh, mini skirts and all that. But because we were sponsored by a sports company, I wasn't allowed to wear mm. anything else apart from tracks that we were sponsored by. You know, you yeah. know, Puma and. Um, Kappa. Kappa was one of the key sponsors as well. Yeah, people sleep on Kappa. I rate Kappa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, Kappa was... um Okay, so, you know, when we get sponsored by these sports company, we need to learn a little bit more about them. So we used to study and they used to have meetings with us and they used to tell us about the history about the, the, the particular tracksuits. Mm. And I'll share with you, with Kappa, um, you probably... I'm, I've got this reel that's on uh, my Instagram. Um, okay. Basically, with Kappa... At the time, it was the 1984 Olympics in LA. And Kappa sponsored the American track and field team. So mm -hmm. the tracksuits that we wore in Electro Rock was the track and field tracksuits. That's the name of the tracksuits. It's called track and field. Nice. So they gave me the red one to promote for the Olympians. So when you check it, you see the style of that tracksuit was worn by Carl Lewis, um, Florence Griffiths Joyner, rest in peace, Percy mm. Joyner, you know, a lot of the and the great Olympians back then. Wow. You know, nice. You know, we, you know, so that red tracksuits that I wore, I don't know if you've seen Electro Rock at the beginning, um, when I just wear the red tracksuits. But that was the what you were rocking from the Olympics of the nineteen eighty four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was to promote the Olympics. And that's why I wore it because Kappa asked um that I have the red to promote um, the track and field team. So when you watch Electro Rock and you see that tracksuit, you understand why I was wearing that red one. That was part partly the reason why to promote the um the 1984 Olympics. But it's yeah. funny, isn't it, how hip hop is such a culture? It reports its it reports its position culturally. It speaks on the news of the day, and it's that's mad that you're. This is the second time you've done it in this talk where you've explained what was going on at the time that made you guys either wear a certain thing, be performing yeah. at a certain thing. And that's a beautiful, this is beautiful footnotes to what, that we all herald and celebrate as hip hop, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more because like uh, when B Street came out, um, B Street um, was also sponsored by Puma. And then um, there was a lot of tracksuits that were in B Street. So when we got the sponsorship now through um, Puma, they didn't want us to wear the Puma States. So if you check it, we weren't allowed to wear Puma States. You know, the suede? Mm. You got the Clyde and the... Okay. That's There's right. different types of Pumas back then. The Clyde, the States, and the suede. Mm. Yeah? So they all look the same, but they're slightly different. We weren't allowed to wear the trainers because Puma said there's no point in wearing them, wearing them trainers if they're already in the shops. Gotcha. So when we went to the warehouse, we said to them, we got the trainers, we said, we want to wear these. And Puma, they were saying, no, you know, they were saying, no, you can't wear them. We want you to wear this section of trainers, any of these trainers, just get from trainers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So back then, Puma wanted us to promote all the things that was not in the shops or about to go in the shops. So right. you noticed back then how we dressed. We didn't have our, our name buckle. You know, we couldn't wear the name bottles or yeah. we couldn't wear any other sports um, tracksuits because we wasn't allowed. It wasn't part of the contract. And back then, we were kids. We didn't understand about these contracts. But you were also head of the game and all the gear that you wore went in the shops. Yeah. to my mother, you know, because my mother, she was the manager and she started to write because she couldn't put the four the tracksuits for all of us. Yeah, because mm -hmm. back then, the tracksuits, they were expensive, you know. Mm -hmm. So she wrote to Adidas. <clears throat> And she told Adidas about her being like, um, you know, a single mom at, at the time, you know, mm. a single mom and had to write, uh, you know, take these crew to perform on TV. Mm. And can she have 
um, uh, a discount or some sponsor, sponsorship. And Adidas wrote her back saying, yeah, you know, we wow. need to have a discount and keep us posted and send us pictures. And so that's how it started, all this sponsorship. So <clears throat> when we got through to the um, audition wow. of the lecture, yeah, mm -hmm. a youth worker we used to work with, I'm not going to call his name, a youth worker we used to work with, what happened, um, my mother said to him, um, write some letters. So, you know, because back then we had to write letters. It wasn't no email in business. Mm, mm. But my mother was um, said to him to write, you know, to these companies and she structured some letters and she made phone calls as well to these companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she phoned these companies. So credit to my mom for doing all this and being, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? God bless her, man. She, you know, she's there in Jamaica, sunny Jamaica. Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah, but... People tend to forget the mothers, even Cookie Crew, her mother was so supportive. You know, a lot of the mothers, mm. Rock City Crew, when we used to go to Nottingham, the mothers was always there behind us. People That's forget fantastic. about the mothers. It's just learning on your feet yeah. with the people around you how to manifest these careers within the genre that yeah. is giving you a voice and a. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's crazy. And it's reasonably cheap to enter, given the circumstance. You know, you haven't got to learn to play guitar or something. You haven't got to be 10 years deep in anything. It's like, let's just go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. And, you know, I, I could tell, you know, I could tell you some stories, man, because, like, back then, graffiti was criminal. We wasn't allowed to do it. You're mad. Mm -hmm. Black kids doing graffiti on walls. We get arrested. Mm -hmm. But shortly later, you know... <laughs> You know, we were blessed, man, because by then we had a house that, you know, a mum bought our yeah. house and what have you. So we could graffiti on our house as much as we want because it was our house. We bought it, you know. So <laughs> police came to arrest my brothers one day. <laughs> I'm going to laugh, you know, for graffiti all over our house. And it was <laughs> our house. My mum was like, yo, get out, you know. Back then That's hilarious. Was, oh, yeah. Police would just kick up. I can't remember. I can't. I can't forget the day. You know, we, we was all there having breakfast, and you know the police. They come early in the morning, yeah, as yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kick yeah. up our door, but they're gonna arrest my brothers for for graffiti in your <laughs> own. That's. <laughs> I'm dead. That is absolutely that. Yeah, we're there having breakfast and eating, and bang. You know, back then the police used to bang down the doors. You know what I mean? Kick up the door. Excuse. Yeah. They come to arrest my brothers. Yeah. And that my is... said, for what? And I said, graffiti. She said, what graffiti? They've been doing graffiti on houses. What house? Well, there's graffiti outside the house now. My mum said, I bought this house. What are you talking about? It's our house. My mum said, get out of the house. Kill me I'm off. I'm going to arrest my son. <laughs> oh, oh, my God, goodness. It's a comedy sketch. It's my house. Yeah. yeah. Absolute crackers. The things we had to go through. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Actually, it's while started. we're on the subject of this, because you know, I do I do want to quickly touch on your uh, your creative oh. endeavors from the Art Breakers project. Um, and the work that you do that 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 you do on surfaces and on mediums that uh they're inspired and often generated from your footwork. And printing on with with paint on 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 the actual surface and, and paper etc. Right. So how that came about? Um, I was invited to the Netherlands to do some work with Martha Cooper, a legendary photographer, you know, historian. So Absolutely. what happened now? Um, I was I was just out, you know, I was unfit to dance and what have you. But people were still asking me to get down and do some moves and what have you. And you know, I was just you know about two years out of childbirth, you know, I was, you know, recovering still and what have you. Mm. So I thought, you know what, I love the dance, I love the culture, I love the music, everything, but I'm going to have to do this in my own time and space. Mm. So I thought, let me, um, you know, find a way how, you know, to get back in shape and what have you. And then my son came from the nursery with some handprint um, paintings. You know when the kids do handprint paintings? From yeah. The nursery? And that was it. I said, you know what, I'm going to do this with people and and that's where it came from. So you're break dancing on the surface, putting paint on the sh on the sneakers, on the shoes, yeah, and um, moving to the music, creating patterns on the on the paper. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so it's Incredible. all about expressing. So the music that I listen to it, it varies from jazz music um, to um, ambient sounds of the mm. sea, things like that. You know. Mm. So the music I'm listening to the music for my energy, for my healing, or what have you. You know. Mm-hmm. And however I feel is what I do on the canvas or on the board. Mm-hmm. The music now, you know, there's a there's a thing that they call synesthesia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where you listen to music and you see colors. I see colors in music. That's right. When I listen to music and I see colors. I use those colors in the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So you have that. Colors. Pardon. So you have that. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh. I see colours in music all the time, all the time, all the time. Saxophones always purple, pianos are yellow, and you know, yeah. Wow. I listen to music, I just see colours. I think, I'll tell you the truth, I thought everybody saw colours in music. Wow. When we, when, when, when we used to um, <clears throat> go to school and they used to say, red and yellow and pink and green, purple, I can see a rainbow. I could see colours. I could see colours in music. Even now, I don't know. I'm sure you can. Yeah, I'll have to think about that one. There, there's some people, I've I had a friend that can see colours in words. And that 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 always used to freak me colors out. Colours in music. Yeah, but colours in music. That Now you come to mention it. You must have done. Yeah, I'm sure there's something there. I must have done. <laughs> what you're talking, yeah. It resonates you saying it. Mm. Mm. But with Artbreaker, um, it's all about having a signature. So instead of like going to break dance and do my footwork at an event, I do my footwork on the board or on the mm. canvas and then I take it to the event. So mm. it's a way of you buying my signature move or buying my imprint of the, you know, the B girl, the first B girls. Only I can do this. That's so uh, sick. It's just a it's just a unique way to say. This is my signature. It's like having an autograph on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. This is my autograph on board on on a canvas, or that's what it is. Yeah. That's the best. I absolutely love it. What an amazing bit of conceptual I street think art. Going to do it now as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you were the first. You're the first at a lot of things, Hanifa. Yeah. How do you feel about that when I say that? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it feels. I don't, I don't know. It feels good. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the way you're looking at me is like, yeah. oh, yeah, come on. No, you know, it's all good. You know, mm. I'm humble still, you know. Yeah. I'm humble, I'm a humble sister, you know. You're killing it. And more power to you, Hannah. Hun, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been fantastic. Hey, listen, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. For, for real. Me. Great getting to know you in this. Short space of time, but it won't be the last. I promise you that we're it definitely going to be the last up. because we're going to hook up. I'm hoping to, you know, yeah. do more interviews and do some more work with people who, you know, what I mean, if you show love to me, I'll show love back to you. You know, that's how I do it. You know. Let's get it, Hannaford. I'm all about that. Thank you so so much for joining us on the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of it. Another one through the through the gates and out the traps. I love uh, big, yeah, a big shout out to Hannah for each and every time. Wolverhampton stand up, 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 up. Um, Birmingham, Coventry, you name it. Salute my favourite peoples. Um, well, Alan was out of fashion. You stay lucky. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't remember. Crime don't pay, but neither do they. Stay lucky. Easy. 